Whiskey. And now the stupid. <sighs> hey, it's but Brian. we're recording I'm now. Who is recording? Brian took yep. over. I think. Hi. Good morning. Oh, that's why it's not working. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> it's like, why can't I claim host? <laughs> All right, I've got you. Take over. Yes, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out, Gary. Totally, utterly failed this morning. <laughs> All right, I got minutes. I got minutes. So uh, if you guys want to get going, um, go for it. Okay, are you going to display the agenda? But, uh, well, at least we can see that Rai is a critical uh, resource when he's not <laughs> well, around. Doesn't if I had been prepped, good. if I had been prepped, everything would have been just fine. That's just me trying to scramble it to, you know, because I have things I do. He has things he does. Cross training is good. Yeah. Well, it's just. I don't know. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm quite entertained by this whole process. This might be the. Sadly, this might be the habit of my day. <laughs> this is very sad, Gary. <laughs> Brian, Brian, can you stop the recording and restart? Because I don't think anybody's going to care to listen to any of this. <clears throat> I, I, I think they might, Arno. This banter is, might be more exciting than the rest of the call. Who knows? I'm not sure everybody think... will be as easily entertained as you, Gary. Sorry. It's okay. We'll all fix it in post. Oh, yeah, okay. we can do that. I think you're, pass I think, I think, I think you're passing judgments on the uh, on the general population and underestimating them. All right. Well, send Gary one of those uh, spoons to keep him occupied. Yeah, Gary, you okay. must be really bored in quarantine. Dave, so we're looking you're at displaying Aruna's your screen now. Screen now but That's not, not the agenda. It's not me. At you. Who is sharing now? <laughs> Looks like Aruna is sharing. Aruna. I don't know that this is intentional. There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't mind sharing. Dave, can you share? If not, I'll share. It's okay. Uh, I'm trying to get back into the meeting. Six, seven, zero, one. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And um, I will. I'm in. Okay. Share screen, desktop. I should uh, hide my chat where I'm like uh, talking about how you guys are terrible. We'll pretend we're not seeing it. Can you share just the agenda? There you go. Yes. Yep. Thank you. But just the agenda. All right. You're sharing. I got gotcha. you. Right don't 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 overwhelm Dave. He's 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 he can only handle one thing at a time right now. Thanks, Gary. Too small. Chris will never able. How's that? Uh, oh yeah. He's, here we go. Too small for Chris. I can guarantee. Yes, please. Thank you. What about Gary, he's got old eyes. No, Gary's. Not. Oh, don't. We? That's true. Okay, enough, guys. Let's be serious. It's 10 minutes <laughs> after. Let's get started. How's that? Are we getting hey, bigger welcome, now? Welcome, everyone. This is the weekly TIC call. This is a public call. Everybody is welcome to join, listen in, or contribute. There are two requirements, though. You should be aware of the antitrust policy, the notice of which is displayed. And this is the hyperledger code of conduct, which basically requires that uh, you behave uh, decently and participate in a positive manner. So with that being taken care of, we can move on to the agenda. I don't have any announcement, but I wanted to give everybody an opportunity to announce anything that would be relevant. Is there any announcement? Okay, hearing none, we'll just move on. There were three quarterly reports submitted. Thank you for this. Uh, looking through them, I didn't see any questions or issues that the projects wanted to raise. So I will just broadly ask if there's anything that the uh, GSC members or the people who have actually submitted the, the reports want to raise now.
If not, we can just move on. Thank you. There's one thing that I, I will point out is, you know, related to the discussion that we just started regarding the maintainers and the status of the implementation of the repo structure that we have agreed to, uh, we might want to add that to the quarterly reports and uh, try to see if uh, we should have some kind of like, um, how do we call that, like monitoring activity with regard to the compliance level of the project with the policies that we set forth. But uh, let's not get more into the detail of that now. Let's move on. We have one major agenda item for today's call. We have received officially a proposal for a new project. It's actually a graduation from a lab that has been in existence for a while. It was started by Fujitsu and Accenture. And so, Hot, are you the one who's going to present this? I think we have a bunch of people that are going to present. Uh, okay, I'll take. I'll let you take the lead, and then you can. Uh, you guys can figure out how you want to proceed. Sure. Well, I think we have uh, we have some slides that we can share uh, if people want to see sort of an overview and uh, summary of the project. Um, does that sound like a reasonable way to go? Yes. Awesome. All right. Um, let me share my screen. If that's okay. Yeah, so they, thank you. Uh, just to make sure we have, I think we have everybody on. Yeah, uh, it's all yours, Hart. Great. Um, Peter and uh, Fujimoto-san and Takeuchi-san, are you guys all there? Yeah, it looks yeah, like it. We are on the line. Thank you. Great. Yes, okay. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yes, we sure. can. Uh, yeah. So, so we'll start by offering some sort of background and motivation and, and solution details um, of what we're trying to do. So I want to mention the concept. I think Dan O'Prey uh, first put it this way, at least to me, um, that that we sort of live in. A am, world am I the only one that can't hear Hart? It was briefly distorted, but I could hear him up until you stopped him. Yeah, Hart, can you repeat the last 10, 15 seconds? Yes, sure. Sorry. Um, and please feel free to interrupt with questions or, or comments or, you know, if my Zoom has gone out and I'm just talking to myself in the room. Um, so today, uh, we live in a world of many networks, and I believe it was Dan O'Prey who first coined this term, at least when I heard it. Uh, and this, this has a lot of implications. So here's an example of some sort of financial network today that you might see. And this is very simplified. Uh, but the key point is all of these networks need to communicate with each other, right? Everybody needs to share information. My database needs to talk to your database and so forth. Well, what happens when we throw blockchain in here? Um, as the HGF participants heard, uh, you know, we might replace a lot of these databases with blockchain. What happens then? Well, now we're, we, we replace these sort of networks with blockchains, uh, but, you know, we can't just run everything on one blockchain. You know, different blockchains are going to have different requirements. So some blockchains might need, you know, a, a plugin for a distributed identity. Uh, others might need scalability. Um, some, you know, blockchains or functionality is going to need, you know, extra cryptography. Uh, some blockchains are going to need very high transaction speeds. Um, legacy compatibility is a, a big and unfortunate thing that I think a lot of people. <laughs> um, 
Hey, Hart, you're uh, all distorted. Can you hear me now? Yes, now I think we can hear That's you. Normal. I don't know what the issue is. I'm sorry. Um, it sounds like you're swallowing your microphone sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> That's unfortunate. <laughs> uh, good. It sounds so, good now. Great. So anyway, uh, all of these blockchains making up all of these networks are going to have different requirements. And so sometimes sort of uh, conflicting requirements even. So we've come to the conclusion that there is going to be no sort of one blockchain to rule them all. Uh, and we can't just sort of dump everything on a single blockchain. Um, so with this in mind, sort of a key facet of this diagram of how our networks are going to have to work together are these uh, connections between blockchains. And this is where we get into the motivation for the BIF. So the blockchain integration framework uh, intends to define, I guess, a communication model uh, to enable blockchain ecosystems to exchange any data or assets uh, independent of the platform and without a middleman uh, if needed. And this is kind of the overall mission. Um, so before we go further, some sort of basic core principles about this. Um, we want maximum possible pluggability and generality. Uh, so we've designed everything to be plug and play as much as possible. This is incredibly important for something like interoperability when you know, you're going to, your, your whole point is to work with everything. Uh, we don't wanna to have to go through a trust and intermediate blockchain or middleman if we don't have to. There are some cases uh, where we might absolutely have to, but when we can avoid it, we don't want to. We don't want users to have to use tokens for transactions. So many, uh, many public solutions in the interoperability space are token-faced. We found that uh, users and customers don't necessarily want this. And finally, we don't want to have a mandatory token. So I don't want to require our to We lost you again. You swallowed your mic. Second, I It almost sounds like there's some like interference or something. Yeah. Are they using a wireless mic? Uh, no. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear okay. you now. It said I was <laughs> muted by the host. I'm using a wired mic. I don't know what the issue is. Um, okay. I, I, I muted you briefly and then unmuted okay. you. Yeah, so. sorry about that. I guess my internet's just flaky. I think everybody out here in California is... On Zoom. No, it's weird, like crossover from another, like, like, it sounds like when you're like driving between two uh, radio zones to, uh, and, and like you get over interference from a different radio station. That's, that's weird. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. All right, we'll keep All going. Right. So uh, I was just going through some core principles. Uh, so I said, we don't want to have users to have to use tokens. Uh, and we don't want to have sort of a mandatory toll booth. So we don't want to require operators to make money uh, by taking a cut of transactions. Uh, so, you know, you should be able to build a solution uh, where sort of the incentives uh, ensure that uh, transactions will be handled appropriately. Uh, so there are a lot of existing solutions in the interoperability space, uh, but sort of no existing solution really satisfies the, the core principles we mentioned earlier. Uh, so we needed a new way of, of essentially doing interoperability. Uh, and so this, you know, we, we talked from my perspective, uh, we, you know, uh, we came to this conclusion and then we, uh, we talked to some Accenture people and, you know, they had also come to a similar conclusion. Uh, so once we realized that we both wanted to open source our solutions, uh, we decided it would be more efficient in the long run to work together. Um, so uh, we currently have two working code bases, uh, one from each company, and we're in the process of merging the code to build sort of a best of both worlds solution 
uh, that gives us all of the use cases uh, of both code bases. Um, so now uh, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Peter. Uh, Peter, are you there? Do you want to uh, do you do you want to take over from this slide? Yeah, I can. Well, I want to ask does Mishimoto approach this on MC present? Peter, you're super quiet. All right, well, I guess I will stop sharing them and let you take over from here, Peter. Okay, just for a second, I'll call me to switch microphones. Okay. Apparently the, <laughs> the first thing we all need to do is get new microphones. Let me know when you're ready, Peter. Did I cut out again? No, you're still. No, right. Peter okay. is on mute now. We're just not quite tired of listening to you yet, Hart. <laughs> <laughs> That's a surprise. So what if you multicast out your packets to all of us and then we'll randomly decide one of us will order those packets and then send them out? Oh, that would be interesting. Does Peter know he's on mute? I don't know. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's much yes. better. All right, I'm going to stop sharing, Peter, and let you take over the slides from here. OK. Go ahead. OK, we can see your screen. Can you see the slide? Yes. Yep, go ahead. All right. So I'll start off with our short list of design principles. There's a much longer list in the white paper that we'll have a link for at the end or link to. So white support, we wanted to support all the ledgers possible because that's pretty much the bedrock of the interoperability solution. You know, everybody will ask us, do you support this, do you support that? And we want the answer to be either yes, of course, or well, yes, but we definitely, or no, but we definitely could. This also leads to the plugin architecture that we are designing, which uh, I'll talk about much more in detail in the later slides. So here I'll just mention that it's all about flexibility. Uh, prevent double spending where applicable. It's very important to say where applicable because we've concluded that there are edge cases that are simply out of scope, not just for us, but pretty much for anybody or anything who tries to prevent double spending when integrating different ledgers. There's a little longer essay about this in the questions answers that we have produced as part of the feedback. I believe that was uh, already published by Hart earlier. Uh, the gist of it is that everything's fine with preventing double spending if you have two permission ledgers, for example. But if you have one permission ledger and one permissionless ledger with, let's say, proof of work, as the consensus, then you can never really be sure if there's going to be, let's say, a 51% attack on that ledger that completely erases all transaction history. Now, you know, people can always argue what's the probability of this happening or uh, why would someone actually just completely erase the ledger, but nevertheless, it's possible. So, uh, that's why it's important to say that we aim to prevent double spending where applicable. Preserving ledger features is about making sure that we don't just, or we don't constrain the end users to this uh, stripped down bare bones feature set, set that is the 
common denominator between the ledgers that they are transacting with because uh, integration is nice, but you also probably want to enjoy some of the higher level features. Uh, and obviously sometimes these features with, conflict with each other in you know ledger A and ledger B that you're transacting with, but uh, there can be a good enough abstraction on our side that allows you the use of as many features as possible we just have to work on it. And I will again invoke the plugin architecture here, which we, we are going to depend on a lot to actually deliver on this design principle. And then last but not least, low impact. We do not want some really heavy handed solution as Hart mentioned as well. We do not want to be a middleman. We want to be as easy to set up as possible and we do not want to have any unintended uh, side effects. So one of our uh, main components in the system architecture is validators. Uh, these are essentially validator nodes similar to uh, normal nodes of a ledger or peers, however you call them but uh, they have the extra added capabilities uh, injected from the framework, which allow for uh, signature validation. So the validator nodes have a responsibility of being able to communicate with a specific ledger that the framework is connecting. And I already mentioned the services that it provides. Uh, we call them foreign validators uh, from the perspective that a validator is able to give you an attestation of a certain state uh, record of a given ledger. And uh, another question that came up was uh, about Corda. So I wanted to stop here and uh, and also mention here what I answered there, which was that uh, we try to make very few assumptions about what a given ledger is. And we try to keep the abstraction very simple so that as many of the ledgers as possible can be really fit in that definition because obviously if some ledger is so different from our abstraction, then we just won't be able to work with it. And so pretty much the only thing that we assume about a ledger is that it is a database with read write capabilities and with uh, the capability to execute custom code, uh, you know, AKA, AKA the contracts and that custom code can also read and write the data. So as long as you bring us a ledger that is capable of doing these things, which is pretty much every ledger, uh, then our design, the, the core of the design should allow us to write a so-called connector plugin for that ledger. And uh, all the higher level features that you may have are something that the other types of plugins that we have or will have in the future will be able to work with. But the core functionality to be able to produce signatures for attestations of the states of the ledgers and to submit transactions to the letters, ledgers. So those core functionalities will operate as long as your ledger is a read write database with custom code execution capabilities. Some technical info about the project. We use JavaScript, more specifically TypeScript. We transpile from TypeScript to JavaScript and run it on Node.js, but also planning on having a client side SDK. 
uh, which actually should be universal in the sense that it runs on Node.js and the browser as well. Okay. And uh, the plugin interface should is, is not constrained to JavaScript only. Eventually, it will be able to accept calls from any language without you actually having to write bindings for that language. And uh, a good idea we've seen elsewhere for this type of support is the Go plugin, which allows you to start your uh, main application and then launch a gRPC client and launch a binary, which is the plugin, which will host a gRPC server and communication will be established between the two over HTTP or more specifically gRPC. And this way your plugin can implement a well-defined uh, interface, API interface that is callable by the main code base and it does not matter what your language is, what your choice of language is for the plugin. This is uh, just for reference. This is uh, one of the many uh, use cases that we've documented in the white paper. I'll keep mentioning the white paper because that's our biggest, uh, most standalone document we have. So I, I recommend that if you want to have a read, then that's where to go. Basically, what you see here is uh, the BIF API standing between the end users and the ledgers and giving you this uh, common abstraction layer for those users to interact with the ledgers through. This shows an idea of how the layers of the architecture are. And uh, this should give you an idea of what it is that you need to implement yourself if you are, let's say, in a, an enterprise environment where you are an application developer who is tasked with writing an application against BIF that, uh, makes some business case reality. So the idea is that you deploy BIF as a software and you either use the plugins that are already there or if you have some uh, ledger that is not supported, you can write your own plugin. But the happy part is that you just uh, clone BIF from GitHub, you deploy it, and then you start writing your own application where our SDK is a dependency. And uh, you just point that to your own BIF deployment wherever that server or cluster of servers is running. And then you're good to go. So under the hood, this is uh, going back to what the validator node is. There's a... Uh, on chain logic, which means that that's a uh, code that runs in smart contracts that we deploy through the chain. This is uh, why I mentioned in the beginning that the abstraction of ours needs custom code execution. Basically, we put the public keys onto the smart contract as part of its state, and then we use that to validate signatures so that uh, the attestations can be created about the ledger's state. And then on the off-chain logic, that's where it's really just uh, a REST API with some endpoints on the validator node itself. It's just a web application, basically, which is what you use or leverage to build your business application that talks to it. Exporting requests means that you can send the REST API request to 
the server saying that you want, uh, let's say, a block worth of data or some kind of state data on your ledger, export it to another ledger, and then it gets copied over and you will have cryptographic proof from the original ledger that this was indeed the state on that ledger. And now it has been copied over to the other ledger. The plugin architecture. So this is the backbone of it all because uh, always the biggest question is, well, how do you know that this design is actually going to be worth anybody's time? How do you know this will work in a few years when new ledgers come out with different ideas? So my or our answer to that is nobody really knows the future, but uh, we are doing our best to prepare for it. We really ask everyone to chime in on especially this because we believe in this particular sense we are doing the best we can to prepare for that unknown future and so the line is we want software that bends not breaks when major technological shifts occur and so far for this uh we have plugins or plans for plugins, I should say, with identity, certificate authority, ledger connector and storage. Now the storage is a little bit different from the ledger connector because you may want to store um, certain metadata that you don't actually want to put on the ledger because maybe it's expensive to store data on your ledger or maybe it would be a performance bottleneck. Um, you know, maybe you're running a financial institution and there's some metadata about each transaction that you want saved and you want it in a database, but you don't want it on the ledger. So for that, we also want, uh, a storage plugin separate from the ledger connector which at first sight it may look like they are kind of redundant of each other and the plugins are loaded at runtime so that there's complete flexibility about how to uh, compose your deployment meaning that before you deploy or before you actually start your deployment you have to provide uh, the list of plugin IDs that you want loaded for the different purposes uh, that are available. And uh, now I'm going into the open source ideas that we have. The important thing to mention here is that if you want something supported by BIF, uh, you don't necessarily have to even come and talk to us like ever. Because with the previously mentioned mechanism, what you can do is really just start your own GitHub repository. Uh, have a look at our interface definition for that set plugin and start writing code and publish it, put it on NPM as a package, for example. And then the next thing you can do is just uh, install that package, specify it to be loaded and used. And as long as it doesn't actually crash your code that is, then it should just work. That's the idea. And uh, we really hope that this will uh, make it easier to spring up a community of developers who look at this and say, oh, that's great because if I need something urgently, I can just write it myself. And I know from experience, personal experience, that there are people like that. It's just not the majority, but there are always people like that in the community. And if you enable them, they can uh, contribute greatly. Uh, 
yeah, but you really have to give them the opportunity to do that. And that's what we're trying to do. So if you ask me, what about supporting X, Y, Z? This is always the workflow that my head or my mind will uh, execute. If there's a plugin already, then good. Then you just use that plugin. That's what I will say. I will point you to the plugin. If there isn't one, then I will ask myself, okay, is this an aspect that's already pluginified, such as the connectors, the storage, or uh, or is it something completely new? But if it's a, an aspect that we already support via plugins, then I'll just say, well, go implement your plugin and then use that plugin and you don't have to wait for my approval ever just do it and then there's the edge case which hopefully will happen rarely if we get the initial core design right uh so the edge case is that you ask for something that has no plugin to it and it's also just hard coded in our uh, core design instead of being pluggable. So that's going to launch a, a review process on our side saying, should we allow this to be pluginified? And then you can submit a pull request to the actual BIF repository. And in this case, you will have to go through uh, you know, the usual mundane review cycles, everybody chiming in saying this is not right, that's not right, how about that? But if you persist and everybody's happy and we approve it, then we merge that in and then you can implement your plugin based on the interface that you just contributed to Biff and then use that plugin. But hopefully this is, uh, you know, less than 1% of the cases. That's what we are uh, aiming to do. Yes, I think I already talked about the storage plugin. Uh, yeah, so I'm just supposed to mention here that, again, it's a really, really simple interface. And I just wanted to show this as an example that this is how, this is a plugin definition so when I say go and implement the plugin, I really just mean go and write maybe a few lines of code or maybe a few hundred lines of code that implements an interface similar to this. Of course, it's going, it may be a different interface depending on what is it, what plugin are you implementing? And uh, yes, yeah, so the storage plugin Again, I kind of already said this. I just forgot that we had this slide here. Uh, it's important to mention, you know, that we have two code bases and the Fujitsu code base uh, called Connection Chain. That's what already supports uh, escrow moving of uh, assets. So the storage plugin idea actually came when we looked at each other's code base. And I also wanted to emphasize that we are not running our own ledger. We focus on integration, not being a ledger of ledgers. And uh, yes, this is uh, the other design principle about preserving the ledger features. And uh, a great example is, for example, if you are doing a transaction between Basie and Fabric, and both of them have some sort of support for uh, private transactions. You know, Fabric has those uh, private channels. And uh, Basie has something as well, I just forgot the name. But the point is, Technically, they are different features. You know, you cannot just put together a fabric and a basic ledger and they won't just be able to talk to each other. But since functionally on a higher level of abstraction, it's they are doing the same thing with private transactions. Uh, that means that 
we could come up with the right uh, interface definitions for that and allow a transaction to be private on both sides, leveraging the different features that these ledgers offer. Now, this is uh, obviously much more complicated behind the scenes as I sound it, make it sound in my example. Uh, but this is just the idea. I'm not saying that we already support this, just that this is how we are planning to implement it in the future. And uh, we'll just uh, fix the gimmicks that come up in the meantime as we go, hopefully. And another important thing is uh, the transaction proposal protocol that we have. It, we really wanted to have, be upfront about certain risks so that there's no unintended side effects. This also goes back to double spending. If uh, you are on a permission ledger and someone proposes a transaction to you and they are on a permissionless ledger with proof of work, then we want you to see this right at the beginning when they propose a transaction so that you don't get uh, duped into doing a transaction that you thought was safe in the sense that there is no double spending because we guarantee it. But then there actually was no guarantee like that. And then uh, bad things happen. So we want the protocol to do its best to push this out to the edge to the person who's making the decision to transact or not. And uh, the same can be said about private transactions as well, just to get back to my example. If only one side supports private transactions, then there is absolutely no reasonable expectation of that transaction actually being private because you know that on the other side, everything will be visible. Hey, Peter, I'm sorry. I mean, we are getting close to the end of the call and I'd like to keep some time, so at least the beginning of the conversation, so. Oh, oh, please? I'm sorry. I kind of, I kind of get lost in time. Well, then uh, I think I can just stop because most of it I already said. Performance, yes, for performance, I just want to say we don't want to be the bottleneck. So if there's two ledgers and they're both very fast, we want to be the fastest among those two ledgers so that they both can run at maximum speed. Uh, this is our proposed position at the greenhouse as a project, but we are absolutely open to feedback on that because uh, we could explain it away in any direction, really. We have a roadmap that is strongly subject to change. And we have some links and uh, open source community stats. And are there any questions? All right, thank you. So, TSC members, any questions? Uh, yeah, this is Angelo. I know. Um, so, what I, what I actually personally, what I was expecting from uh, the, such a presentation was maybe I'm just biased and uh, I might be totally wrong. Um, I was expecting something like this. So, what, what is a blockchain? It's a system to build trust. So Bitcoin is the clear example here. So this starts from the, the uh, starting from minimal assumptions. So in Bitcoin, what happens is that you trust the crypto, and on top of crypto, you are building a payment system. So trust in a payment system. So now you are telling you you describe the system, and you never talked about trust. So and uh, so if I want to combine multiple blockchain with their uh, view of trust, what it means to build a new level of trust. This, the, I was expecting actually like something like this from an interoperability project, because otherwise what we are talking about. Yeah, with the, the REST API, GPI, GRPC, these are all beautiful aspects. I don't want to judge on this, uh, on, on this part, but looking at blockchain, uh, maybe you had in the slide and I, we, we didn't have time to, to see that part, but I really would like to see what it means to build trust in this setting. Got it. 
Well, my feedback to that or answer to that is that we intentionally did not speak that much of trust because in a sense, you have to trust the organization that runs uh, BIF. So it doesn't matter if you individually trust the ledgers, it's not going to be enough to transact between them. You will have to trust this third party, whoever that may be, who runs the software that, in, that performs the integration between those. So trust uh, in that sense is sort of implied, but it's a, it's a very long topic. And I also want to allow the other team members to chime in if they want to. Yeah, sure, I'll chime in. So basically, uh, the idea here is that is, is that the trust is whatever you want it to be. You know, we want this to be as configurable as possible. So, I mean, our basic uh, philosophy is that we cannot say what your trust requirements are, or whether, you know, you're on this ledger, are you going to trust someone on this other ledger? Um, you're exactly right that, Angelo, that we probably should have given some examples, but we wanted this to be sort of uh, as up to the user as possible. As, as part of the BIF, we don't want to dictate uh, trust relationships between people. We want them to be able to configure BIF to whatever trust relationships already exist. Uh, did that answer your question? Definitely, I would, I would appreciate a lot if you can put also examples of, the, of this thing because you know, when every time you see, oh, we will, we will, we will like uh, to. I, I, I understand the point of saying we want to be as general as possible, but you know, these are very complex uh, system, and if you leave the freedom, uh, the, such a freedom uh, in the wrong hands, this can be used. I mean, the, probably people can, might believe that they are combining the pieces in the right way, and that can be a total failure. So sometimes maybe less generality, more application scoping and say, oh, you know what, if you have, a, a, if you have a, a, a chain with this trust assumption, another chain with this trust assumption, or out of this, you can build this, a, a new level of trust assumption uh, that can provide an application at this level. Again, the example of Bitcoin is beautiful. Uh, you start from trust in uh, ECDSA and hash functions, and on top of this, you build a decentralized payment system on internet. I mean, which is a, I mean, it's a great achievement. It's a massive achievement. Uh, the guy who designed this uh, would deserve a Trisa Turing Award. So uh, you see the you, you see the point. That will give more confidence. Also, in the fact that the framework can really deliver something useful. But I really appreciate. I really, if I can no help, also I would level, definitely will have a look at the at the document. I think it's a very, it, it's a very very interesting uh, topic, and we definitely have to, as a TSC member, I would like to to push for it as well. So following up on this, I wanted to get back to a little bit what uh, Dan brought up in the on the mailing list, which has to do with okay, you have a lab today. You guys brought both, uh, b you know, bunch of code. And so what is the status? And I understand the idea of, you know, uh, Hart was quite uh, frank about saying, well, the idea of, part of the idea of bringing it up at a project level would be to have more exposure and bring more people in. But beyond that, I mean, what has been basically achieved in the lab? Can you tell us that? Can I talk a little from the Fujitsu? Uh, the, my name is Shingo Fujimoto. And uh, the, to be honest, I would like to have the more resources for the collaboration, since the, the, we are certain uh, uh, the environment like uh, we are restricted to the have the opportunity to meet uh, meet each other uh, more closely. So the, uh, the at least the, we need to the uh, mailing list to uh, exchange the information or discussions. Nowadays, we are doing the same things on the chat, but it is very difficult to uh, develop the, the, or merging the code. So the, we need to do some, uh, the, uh, the, well, openness for the development, but uh, the, that is more uh, easier uh, when we uh, authorize as a of official project. So that is my personal, uh, 
hope to be your official project. Thank you. All right, thank you. I'm not sure I understood though. You're saying as a project, you'll be able to cooperate more easily? I don't so, see that. So, I mean, I think one of the things was uh, we're doing a big refactoring of the architecture, right? To sort of merge everything together. Uh, and one of the reasons we did this was to sort of get everybody's attention. We know there are other people in Hyperledger that are interested in interoperability. Uh, and we want to sort of bring everybody to the table uh, and get feedback on our architecture and, and everything like that and make sure it uh, um, make, make sure it potentially works, you know, for everybody that might be interested, rather than having sort of participants trickle in uh, where we have to do major refactorings every time somebody comes in. Um, so that was a big motivation. Yeah, that that, that's what I did. And so I had a question actually. Is the is the idea that if I have a beef in place, my application will interact with all the networks only through this beef, or is that something that I add to my application to interact with other networks? So basically, I could be a fabric application, but at times I want to go talk to a Bezu network, and then I have beef that I can rely on leverage to go talk to Bezu more uh, in a more standard way, or is does beef become my kind of like higher level in which I interact with all the networks I want to use. Can I speak? <laughs> uh, the, yes, please. The, yeah, Stingo. Uh, the, well, uh, the, I think that the, we can uh, the, develop to the, uh, the, your own application for the particular purposes. Like, uh, this is a kind of uh, the, the template for the other uh, the use cases. So the, if you are building to the shopping cart type of the application uh, that you will use to the this integration framework as a uh, the infrastructure but if you need to do some other uh, use case like a supply chain management they need to be I uh, you need to do another system using to the same integration framework but that service will be the running independently so the this is kind of library type of the uh, the pro project so the we can uh, minimize the uh, such a uh, building cost for the each application as a secure. That is that is my uh, the assumption for the use of the our project result uh, the derivatives. Is that answering your questions? Yeah, uh, I, I think so. Thanks. Uh, I, we only have two minutes left. I wanted to check that, you know, if there's any other members who have burning questions and maybe, you know, obviously we don't have time to close this today. We'll follow up next week if it's possible. But uh, if there's anything people want to get that the, the, the requesters could uh, work on, you know, along the lines of what Angela asked for, he wants more information and the trust assumptions. And so is there anything else? Yeah, we'd be happy to answer any questions by email or rocket chat or, or whatever you like. I know a lot of people have been asking in chat and I've sort of fallen behind on answering questions. Um, but if, if you have questions, uh, please, please follow up. All right, thanks Hart. And thanks to the team, I mean, for helping out and uh, everybody to join in. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So I'm gonna close the call on this but uh, we'll continue next week as hot suggests it'd be best if we could make some progress on the mailing list in the meantime so uh let's keep the conversation going thank you all for joining talk to you next week <laughs>